ยังได้เวลาละชีวิตมาเนี่ยก็กระตาเมียนไงจังยังมันกระยังกระตาก็เคลื่อนไงจังมองมันอายเมียนแต่ไงสลับกระตาเมียนแต่ไงสลับเขาเขียนบทเพลงที่เขียนบนหน้าบ้านของเขาและเป็นบทเพลงที่เขียนในประเทศเวียดนามเขาบอกว่าเราใส่หน้ากากและเราบอกว่าเราสวยแต่มันเป็นความจริงผู้หญิงเข้ามาและเขาบอกว่าเราสวยแต่มันเป็นความจริงเราไม่มีอะไรเราไม่มีชีวิตเราไม่มีอะไรเราไม่มีทางออกให้เราได้รับความรัก Mia grew up in a family where her father was an alcoholic. He would take the money her mother earned and lose it gambling and drinking. Then the baby, her her siblings would cry because they had no food, and he would beat the children and his wife. In her own words, is I couldn't stand for my mother to cry anymore. And there was nothing else I had, so I sold myself into a brothel. And she sold herself into a brothel in Swai Pai at the age of 14. They locked her in a room, and she waited because she was a virgin for a foreign man who would pay a lot of money to be with her. After just a few days, she was brutally raped. 
and that began her life in the brothel. So, uh, as child sex uh, slavery grew in Cambodia, it became uh, available in the major tourist areas. So in order for Swai Pak to stay in business, they started to cater to the extreme fringes of sexual perversion, so offering the very young girls and uh, allowing people to exercise um, kind of strange fetishes like torture and all sorts of weird stuff that most normal people would never even think about or hear of. And here we go, just turning off into uh, a dirt road and here we are in Swai Pak. There were organizations coming in here doing great work. They were shutting down brothels and prosecuting pedophiles. And it was stopping centralized trafficking in Swai Pak. But the next phase is stopping decentralized trafficking. Little girls are still for sale here, but there's no more brothels. It pushed it to the fringes to where when people come, he goes, he sits at a coffee shop, the pimp approaches him, he says what he wants, they go get the girl. So at least have a hard time tracking that and really building a case against something like that. Hello. How you doing? How you doing? Good. So what you doing here? So what you gonna do when you're done with your coffee? What you gonna do when you're done with your coffee? I think you do understand. Not many people come to Swai Pak for coffee. I don't know. Obviously, he's not going to admit to being a foreign pedophile, but there's no reason to be in Swai Pak uh, other than that. If he doesn't leave now, the reality is he will rape a child tonight, which is just crazy. So I just want to wait until he leaves. Anti trafficking program, Courtney? No, I just think you don't need to tell me. No, I think I do need to tell you, and I am going to tell you. This is what I do, okay? When you're finished with your coffee, you're going to have to leave. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We don't confront pedophiles anymore because we found that they basically just go down the street to find someone else that will offer them a girl. So it doesn't solve the problem. There are many countries in the world that suffer from abject poverty. And there are a number of countries who have suffered a genocide but there's things about Cambodia that make it unique. In most countries, it's an ethnic group against an ethnic group. In Cambodia, the genocide was actually imposed upon itself by all the people of Cambodia. When Pol Pot took over with the Khmer Rouge, he vacated the urban areas, sent everyone out to the rice fields, and he determined that he would need to execute the educated people. Still, of course, rice didn't grow any better when the educated were gone, and so he went after the religious. 
And then finally what he did is he separated first husband from wife and then the children from their families completely. In the end, the children were used to torture and execute their own families. Those children are today the parents. So they're living in abject poverty, they're uneducated, without a moral compass, and no family background to call upon. And it results in the trafficking of little girls. And I believe that this country is the worst place in the world for that specific type of human trafficking. There are over a hundred brothels on the street. And every year, uh, the anti-trafficking police, they come down here uh, and raid brothels. And on this street, there was an article that said, $1.25 for a normal girl, uh, $2.25 for a beautiful girl, young girl. It's highly complex. And that in turn shows us that our response to the issue of human trafficking here also needs to be really diverse and really complex. How do we take a man who has been trafficking his own daughter, raping his own daughters, and convince him with mere logic that he should stop? It takes more than that. It is not just sexual abuse. For the majority of the children in our care, it is sexual abuse that's been combined with torture, um, with bondage. You can't just go find girls and just take them out. And so you have to work through a very trustworthy series of steps. In 2003, IJM successfully advocated um, with authorities to do a large intervention in Svipak. And there were 40 girls who were rescued out of that community. And many considered that to be the shutting down of Svipak. But we were aware, especially being on the ground here, that really the story had not ended. Mian was in this brothel in Swai Pak the day that IJM made a raid. She hid, feeling that she was going to get in trouble with the police, and one of the pimps found her and took her to another brothel. <laughs> Some people will say, oh, when a good are like you, they have a good life, a new life, new hope, but it's not. It's just their beginning or starting a new life. So aftercare is their journey. So if there is no aftercare, the girls still stay in the same situation. So it's no use to rescue them. It's no use at all. What we're talking about is healing a child that's been through unbelievable abuse. How do we do that? Girls were being actually put in jail along with the perpetrators. There was no place for them to go. So in 2005, we moved to Cambodia to found ARC, and we began the process to care solely for the trafficked and abused girls. At our restoration center, we have 57 girls, and the average age is between 8 and 12, 13. Some of our girls have been trafficked for as long as six years, so they come in requiring a lot of therapy, a lot of love, a lot of needs. Her abuse started when she was about four. She lived with a family who didn't care about her. She was a source of income. They would sell her, or her own family would rape her. They would throw their scraps on the floor and the dogs would go after it and she would have to fight among the dogs. 
The first day she was there, I watched her and she had her arms out like protecting her food and she was just glancing around and she would just be shoving the food in her mouth so quick and it'd be on her face and in her hair and she'd be looking around to make sure nobody was trying to get it. It just horrified me to see this gorgeous little girl that nobody cared for. I know if it was me, I'd be wondering if somebody was out there who would help me. ไปมันคืออนอดจังเถอะไปอนดังเกตเถอะดาอนจัง <coughs> <coughs> ตัวบ้านภายปีแบบตึกอือหือยังมีรําไพ่ปู่ม้าปู่เวิร์ดฟอร์อ่านเต้ยังบ่เนื้อเคลงกัดไคลเอ๊ะกระทาวนั่งพ
they sing uh, all these people come to kill them recently. You know, the first time we, we move here, we have no friends, we have no people to... I mean, that we look like a stranger in the community. So the first day, we show up with our volunteers. And by the way, you should know that our volunteers were girls from ARC. Girls who had been through the program and came down to Swipak to volunteer to work with these kids. And so we showed up in that first kids club, about 30 kids showed up. Probably in the last five years, the focus point was much more lockdown type brothels that had sex on the premises. It was easy to go in there and say, okay, this man has been caught with this girl in this bed, so we know that we can prosecute them. About 70% of them now do not have sex on the premises because they're just karaoke bars and the girls will get taken by the men off premises. There are large numbers of girls, even 200, 300 in these places, which then just is a shift in strategy of how do you address an issue like that and effectively both investigate and intervene in situations like that. We're going to be going to two karaoke clubs and one hotel. Our goal here is to play the part of a pedophile, and you're trying to gather useful information, who sold them, how much they sold them for, what province they came from. Tomorrow we have a meeting with IJM and some anti-trafficking police, and so if they deem the information um, compelling enough, they'll act on it. What will you guys do with this information when you get it? Hello, Sir Sudai. Sir Sudai. Hello, Sir Sudai. Sir Sudai. Hello. 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 Sir Sudai. It's like the girl went to the girlfriend in the room. We like. If we like those girls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. You, uh, you choose. We choose. Yeah. just like on the brink of just like breaking down, you wanting to cry, breaking down, you just wanting to kick somebody's head in and just get her out of there. Even being next to her, I knew she was just terrified of me, you know, like just the way she freaking touched me and everything just felt, you know, she's reaching for my hand, you know, doing everything she was taught to do, but you could tell she was just, she was just scared out of her mind, it was a trip, man. Whether they go in and bust it or not, hopefully there's enough information to get the girls out. You know, it's just, it's almost bad that you make personal connection because then it just hurts you more when nothing happens. It's almost better to be conceptual 
about the whole thing of just saying like, oh, human trafficking is happening, these girls are happening. And you freaking just like, you're just with the girl for a while. There was a whole lot of girls that were on the street there. Those were perfect. And there was a room there, and there was three girls, and they were like six, eight, and ten. Before you ever come here? Yeah, all the time. How much you spend for? Well, it used to be five dollars, and then then it went to thirty dollars in 1995. Do you have some friends at some time? Well, yeah, I have some friends, but they were going for like 16-year-old girls. Right There's so many people in Cambodia that have no idea what's going on. They think that there's sex going on, but they don't understand about the torture, the severe abuse that these girls go through. ให้บ้านให้บ้านมานั่นบ้านตะแคร้ายโดยเธอกล้าใจจองลุยคนนายใจจังนะคือจึงกล้าตามผิวตามผิวก็บ้านฉันตะจึงกล้าเอาติดต
just an honor to be a part of, to see. ແລະຫຼັງຄອກນີ້ໂດຍໃນໃນເອຊີບັນຫຼືໂດຍຫນ້າລະອາປັກຍານຂອງອ້າຍເອີຍັງບັນຈັດດັງໃຫ້ <coughs> A lot of kids get sold by their parents because of financial needs, you know, medical costs, uh, food costs. So two ways of combating that is offering medical care. Thursdays we offer medical care. And we do food relief. We just gave out two tons of rice last month. We offer educational programs so that these kids have an option. We have a children's community program as well. Kids learn songs, they learn about trafficking, they learn about families. They cut the nail and they wash the hand and tomorrow they will clean the womb. We try to show people that we, the kid is very important that we want to take care of them. Every day people in the, this community they come and to meet us and they ask us for help. I mean that every hour they come and they ask like the children to go to school or they have a sick or disease or they need to go to the hospital and we spend time with community. They can come and they ask me anytime. I told them we are here for you. Boys are just as vulnerable as the girls in Swipe Pond. But instead of being sold, they're being groomed to be traffickers. So we started the gym because we realized, unless we intervened, there was a course of life already planned out for them. We had one guy, he was making $2,000 for every trip he made into Vietnam to trick girls and to traffic them back into Cambodia. Through the gym and through the influence of the gym, he's really changed his heart and his mind. And now, instead of trafficking girls and making $2,000, now he makes $50 a month working construction. And he chose to do that. You know, we can meet all the needs in the community and take away all the, the pressures on a family, you know, whether that's medical or, or food or paying for the kid to go to school. And sometimes that family will still traffic their kids because at the core, it is a, a moral issue. We're not talking about a, a shift in culture or changing culture. We're talking about changing values. If a mother looks in her child's eyes and sees a value, she will not traffic that child. You need to 
separate the two places in your so, talk to IJ. So we tell them the first place? Yeah. 30 girls? Yeah. Under 18. Okay. Girls under 16. Conservative 10? 10, 10, yeah. Okay. Um, there was two stray mouths, so let me do the first. Okay, so... Uh, the girl you were with, Srey Mao, second place? Yeah, yeah, Kampot. yeah, second place, Srey Mao. She's from Kampot? Yeah, yeah. Kampot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 15 years old. Okay. Uh, needed money for her to take care of her mother. Yeah. Take. It's crucial that we document everything we've seen, everything we've heard in order for organizations like IJM to put a complete report together in order to get judges to issue warrants to go back in to rescue the girls. Okay. And see, you know, you can see where we were at the room was 10 bucks, $4.20 for a beer. Girl, five bucks. So the girl so was as much as a bunch of the grapes. Groups. It's just hard to, hard to imagine that you'd get a receipt yeah. I mean, when you see that, you understand the depth of the trauma. Well, yeah. you understand that you can't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a better way to say it, you know, I mean, how many times a night? They're open to three or four in the morning. But it's not even just the, the sexual trauma, it's the whole, the whole process is so objectifying. Just oh, the guy yeah. comes in, they come, and then they have to stand up, they got to smile, they got to do the whole thing. And I mean, even that process has got to be so deeply traumatizing to their self-image, to, mm -hmm. to what they think of themselves, just, you know, their cattle at that point. Really, the emotional trauma that they suffered with us. Yeah. Right? I mean, with yeah. us, through what is he going to do, what does he want from me, Yeah, yeah. what am I going to have to do, and then when it's over with us, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> because they didn't have to do anything, they weren't forced. But through that whole process, that hour and... 10 minutes or something they spent with us. Yeah. What were they thinking emotionally as they did all that stuff? And how deeply are you traumatized by that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and in most cases, it doesn't end like it ended with us. Yeah. You know, it's ending up in some room. If, if the operation was successful, that's potentially, you're talking potentially 100 girls. If you could only get the girls out that we made a connection with, I would still feel better. But just the, the idea of just interacting with those girls, seeing their life, seeing their faces, you know, being so close to them and just thinking they might not get out, man, that's, a, that's too much. So to bad you today? Ah bad, so to bad. Come on. The healing for the girls takes place in a unique way. We use trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Now this therapy is recognized as the very best way for girls to recover from the kind of trauma that we're talking about. It's based on a cognitive triangle, which says what we think determines what we feel, determines how we act. An example would be this. I think I am trash because of what a man did to me. I feel hopeless, and a result for that, it's no use for me to study because I'm just a piece of trash. Imagine this. You're in a room with a hundred other girls, and some foreigners come in, and you stand up and smile. They're going to pick a girl. There's part of them that's disappointed. If you don't pick them, why am I no good? There's the other side saying, oh God, please don't pick me because I know what he's going to do to me. And then there's the other side of it. If he doesn't choose me, I can't get any money for my family. And some of these girls have things that are even beyond that. Some of the girls were forced to help a pedophile rape another girl in a brothel to hold her down while she screamed. And now they carry the guilt of that on top of everything else. And it's just a, it's, um, again, it's beyond our imagination 
what what these girls have suffered, and it's not a it's not a quick fix. You can't bring a kid in here and say, well, in two months, we'll put them through a therapy program, we'll get them functionally literate and put them on the street. It's just not going to happen. They have so much to overcome. If we can get back to her and show her that she does have value, it doesn't matter what happens to her. Her value isn't based on what someone has done to her, but who she is. You see, when they leave the therapy session, they will have heard the words that they're valuable, that they're special, and they were made for a special purpose, then they experience it through the caregiving staff. That's where the transformation takes place. I'm very compassionate with them. And then I start to spend time with them by teaching. And I know I spend a lot of time with girls in the evening. Some of the girls go to library so they can be not just a teacher and a student. Sometimes they can be a friend. One thing that I left out of Mia's story is that she used to volunteer at Rahab's house, working with the kids. But the thing for Mia, when the first day she went back, when our van pulled up in front of that place, it was the brothel she was sold into. And she talks about how she was afraid to get out of the van because she knew what an evil place it was. She says when she got out, she saw, oh, it's, it's changed. It's not what it was before. And I go there, I feel like staff of ARC because I work with the kids and I tell them, choose a good way. Do not choose the way I chose. And uh, to see her hold and love those little girls and teach them and the joy she gets from that is amazing. Um. What does she want to do with her future? She decided she wanted to become a tailor. And she talked about her dream. And she said, my dream is to open a small, a tailor shop, not a big one but a small one by my mom's house so I can be with her and I can help support her so she and my, my brother will have enough money to live. I remember sitting in the dining hall eating lunch one day and I looked across and I saw her smiling and I said to Dar, I said, is that Mian? I said, she's smiling. I mean, she's gorgeous. Look at her. And it was just such a transformation, what a smile does. She flourished so quickly, it just restored her dignity. Uh, so IJM took our information, their information, to the, uh, to the anti-trafficking police. And so the anti-trafficking police said the one location, the hotel, the first location we were at, were ha which had about 40 girls in it, uh, they're potentially going to be able to do an operation. So I think operation may happen tonight, may happen tomorrow night, depends on, but I'm, I've been losing sleep. One of the greatest difficulties for any of us involved in, in stopping trafficking is that although great effort will be put into an attempt to rescue a child or stop a trafficker, failure is part of what we have to deal with.
I decided to move to Liu in Swai Pha before I don't want to work here. But when I come to see about the people that come to hurt the children, my heart is broken. I want to restore hope for children. You got all sorts of hardships, mental hardships, physical hardships, emotional hardships from this job. But to be honest, I'm the luckiest guy alive, for reals. Like, uh, all the hardship, everything. You don't, you, you don't have to pay me a dollar. Like, this is, I'm a lucky guy. This is a uh, very hard work. We cannot give the money to change Swipe Up, but we come here and we, we, we start uh, to do like Jesus do, you know. Yeah, so they trust me and they, they start to change. They start to change themselves. I cannot change, but they start to change. <laughs> A person may question, why do we open Rahab's house? Because if you would look at it, Swipak has had lots of economic development. There are educational opportunities. There are great laws on the book to protect kids. But what is lacking in Swipak is a moral compass. The hearts needed to be transformed. People who were committing the crimes had to look at them and say, that's just not right. We were able to take a former brothel. We had to tear down walls. We had to remodel the place. But being able to take a place where children were abused and become a place of hope instead of hopelessness, to become a place of healing and instead of destroying life, words can't express the feeling that comes with being a part of something like that. They're looking at a community that for so long has been defined by its worst level of exploitation that's happened and beginning to say, actually, there's more. And we know that the story is not finished. ដល់កម្លាក់អីចាំមកវិស្ត្រផ្លិចអាយណាលេញមកលោកដល់នៅចំណៃវិជាសម្រាប់ញោមកាលពីមុននឹងមកតុនចាអីតាឥឡូវញ
Mian is a young woman who has suffered just so greatly, but she's doing great in school. She'll be graduating soon. We'll be providing a loan for her to buy her sewing machines. And uh, maybe, maybe the best part of the story for me is my shirt, because Mian made it for me. I can't say anymore right now, I'm sorry. You're just sad to see them go, you know, like your own children, you don't want them to leave, but at the same time, you're thrilled. You're thrilled that they finally have this wonderful life that they never thought that they'd have. ไปนั่งมาดูการท่านอาสาบานเตยเนี่ยเอาให้โดยกอดเอาให้เตยเนี่ยจะง่ายนะกอดยังไม่หมดจะง่ายอามินดอนนานาเขาเอาบานจัด